I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this is Outside My Window. Albert Einstein once said, the only thing you absolutely have to know is the location of the library. Do you know where yours is? Here in the Tri-Counties, we're very fortunate to have library branches in many of our communities, part of the Western Counties Regional Library. We're very pleased to have as our guest, Ian White. He's the Public Relations Manager for the library. Ian, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Gary and Quinn. It's wonderful to see you both again. It's been a while, <clears throat> and I'm very happy to have the library be part of your podcast. Oh, it's great to be back in the library. It's been a few years, I must say, for me, and it's a, it's a great feel. I can't wait to, uh, to get to a couple of books out. This library has a very rich history in, in the community here, Ian, uh, established with the great generosity of a, a very well-known Yarmouth businessman and, and his wife. Yes, uh, I mean, it goes back... It, it, you can dig into that history but just by visiting uh, the Yarmouth branch in particular because we're talking about, in this case, the Isaac Walton Killam Memorial Library, which uh, got its name uh, thanks to uh, Isaac Walton Killam's sisters who uh, inherited some of his money and decided a nice way to honour him was to donate to have uh, a new library built in his name. And and in those in those days, what place in the community would a library have, and and was it a a bit of a status symbol for us to have one over, say, another community? Um, actually, I can't honestly address that because uh, I wasn't around then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think that. Uh, there's always been a, a push to have a library, and, I, and we don't think of status does not come in to it because libraries are there f- uh, for everyone. And it's very important that we provide equal access to anybody who walks through those doors. So um, it's about making those, those services, programs, uh, and, and resources available to all. How many branches are there in this area? Well, um, Western Counties Regional Library services Digby, Shelburne, and Yarmouth counties. And within the counties, we have 10 branches. So we have Westport, Digby, Weymouth, one in Mattagan, Yarmouth, of course, Pubnico, and then Barrington, Clarks Harbor, Shelburne, and um, Lockport. So the Yarmouth would be the headquarters, if I can use that term? Well, it, it so happens that, uh, yes, Yarmouth is our largest branch, and uh, the building has a, uh, a section uh, which is uh, that Western Counties Regional Library rents uh, to use as its headquarters. Um, because the way it works is most places with the regional library system in Nova Scotia, the building is provided by the municipal unit. But there are exceptions, like Yarmouth. So we have a, an organization in Yarmouth called Yarmouth Public Library and Museum. And uh, they basically handle, um, they have their own money. And they, they meet and, and uh, we're fortunate, very fortunate to have them uh, in our community. And they provide this building and keep it uh, updated and up to speed and renovated, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah, we're lucky in that regard. So the Yarmouth branch would supply books and other reading materials to the other branches? The way it works is um, the buildings are the buildings provided by, for the most part, municipal units, but in this case, Yarmouth uh, Public Library and in Shelburne, the Shelburne Building Association. But um, so you've got uh, Western County's Regional Library, uh, puts everything inside the buildings for the most part. Um, some of the furniture is no, but so the books, uh, music, movies, newspapers, magazines, that's all part of Western County's Regional Library, all the staff. So, uh, and so out of, because this is headquarters, everything does come through Yarmouth in that sense. So um, books being transferred from branch to branch. So if I'm in Westport and I want a book that happens to be on the shelf in Lockport, 
well, I put a hold on that through our catalog or with the help of uh, the clerks at our circulation desk. And they ALS, that goes into the system. That book's pulled off the shelf in Lockport and sent in the deliveries. We have a, three delivery vehicles, actually. And uh, that comes through headquarters and then is sent on its way to Westport. The library has certainly changed since I was a kid. Um, it, you know, it, it's grown not just uh, in the physical sense, but in, in a lot of services that are offered. How challenging has it been for the library to keep up with the times, particularly to um, induce the interest of young people? Well, I think that's uh, an age-old challenge, uh, but it certainly uh, involves um, finances and, and training. Um, like anything else, I mean, if you look at uh, healthcare, <laughs> you know, all the new medical equipment that comes in, well, we're just a, a sort of sim- similar to that, but not to that level, obviously. But uh, as technology changes, as we computerized, as, uh, you know, you have to get your staff knowledgeable enough to use all these things, all these tools that become available, and then you have to um, be able to let the public know the benefits and how it works and make them comfortable with it. And and it, it's funny, we don't think of it in, in the library world, but there's a, an element of marketing that's required, I guess, because you have to go out there and, and, and say, look, these are great free services available to you. It's in your community. Um, come and make use of it. <laughs> Um, and a lot of people do, but it's always still a struggle. And uh, whether it's young people, I mean, you can hit the demographic, but I think sometimes it depends on what's going on in a person's life. Like a teen could see some use for a library to hang out uh, or to do some studying or a quiet place maybe to, or they might get an exam proctored here if they're doing something online. But their other priorities are outside the library. But, you know, when they hit become a parent or something like that, the library becomes a place to go again. They bring the young kids to a story time or just to run through the children's section and pull books off the shelf and get excited. Oh, you know, take a big bag of books home to read. You know, so there's that too. What did COVID do to the library system? I know we were chatting a bit about this before we went on record, but, you know, in a lot of cases, COVID just like killed a lot of different services and the like. But what did it do to the library system, and have you guys rebounded? I think we were like a lot of uh, society, uh, you know, businesses, organizations, individuals. Um, we had to deal with continuous change and, and, and trying to figure things out because none of us really knew what was going on um, from government down to, you know, somebody working in the local corner store. So it's just, uh, we, did, we went through the same thing. We had to shut down when we had to shut down. We had to figure out how to deliver services in a way that uh, didn't involve people necessarily coming in the buildings or uh, doing so in a safe manner. Uh, and then as, we, as the pandemic continued, we started to figure things out. We got better at delivering virtual services. So things online, maybe through Facebook, through YouTube, um, and then uh, we also played a role in, in trying to manage the pandemic. So Nova Scotia Health, for example, used libraries to hand out rapid test kits and, and things like that. So, you know, we we're actually we're out in parking lots in municipalities in the middle of winter, <laughs> some cold days and, and you know, um, volunteer fire department parking lots handing out uh, rapid test kits. But we all had a role to play in trying to get a handle on this pandemic. And so uh, I think we all learned a great deal, but it was very challenging. Um, But uh, kudos to our staff who proved very resilient and and did great work uh, and adjusting and learning how to uh, deliver things, you know, via Zoom, via Facebook Live, via YouTube, um, all of those things came into play. And, of course, the library also had to uh, enhance and improve its uh, online digital services. So um, if you look at uh, 
if I jump into it here, um, library. So we worked hard to improve those services. We enlarged a, a, a big collection called Overdrive, and that's our e-books, audio books, and digital magazines. So the collection is, uh, the best way to use it is through its app, which is called Libby, and that helps you navigate uh, the Overdrive catalog of the downloadable books and audio books, and, and you can manage the items you borrow. Uh, we also added Press Reader, which offers access to thousands of newspapers and magazines from across Canada and around the world. Of course, these are all free with your library card. And we added a service called Hoopla, and that allows people to stream and borrow uh, movies, music, audiobooks, ebooks, comics, TV shows, and you can enjoy them on your uh, computer, tablet, or phone, and your smart TV. You just load the Hoopla app and click on it, and you can sit at home and watch your favorite old BBC sitcom or something. <laughs> and uh, if you're traveling to another country uh, or maybe you just want to learn new language, we offer uh, Rocket Languages. So that has courses in 14, pardon me, different languages, including American Sign Language. And it allows you to learn the language, of course, on your own terms and in your own time. So... Uh, those are some of the things we did during the pandemic and some of the services we added. Now, some of those services, would they have been natural evolution at some point anyways? Would those have been services you would have put in uh, regardless of whether the pandemic happened or were they put in specifically because of that and then you've kept them because they've been popular? I, I think that uh, they, it would have been inevitable, um, but I, I think what it did was it made things happen faster, um, faster exactly. And, and it depends on, we're talking about a, a small rural regional library system compared to, say, Halifax or Toronto or Vancouver. You know, they would have had these services and, and many more because <laughs> they have the funding and ability. Right. And well, speaking of funding, uh, how is the library system funded and, and where does that all come from? Well, the majority is from the province. It's uh, 71% of our annual budget is funded by the provincial government. Uh, 26% is funded by municipal units. So, of course, if the province gives less, the municipals, municipalities give less. So there's, you know, that's. And then uh, library boards um, have to raise 3% of their annual budget. So we do that through a variety of means. Uh, it can be through, um, you know, book sales. It can be through things like the uh, Adopt a Book campaign, which we run every two years. We've had different fundraisers for, for different things to raise that money. I know a few years ago, uh, libraries were severely underfunded. There was a, a critical issue. Has that improved, Ian? Um, it's a constant struggle. Uh, we have had our, our budgets frozen for the last three years but then um, every once in a while um, we'll find out post provincial budget that there's a sort of a lump sum bonus if you will it comes in um, but we don't know what that will be and you can't budget for it so um, yeah it's no shortage a, of places to put it though <laughs> no, no there never is and it's challenging but we also uh, go after um, there's different grants and different organizations, businesses that will have funding available for, for certain things. And certainly technology is a big one in, in that regard. So, uh, you know, we're always looking for ways to help us upgrade our, our computer systems or have more uh, interesting and necessary technology available for the, the public. The uh, public plays a, a great role in supporting the library. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about the Adopt-A-Book campaign that's been going on for a few years. Uh, you had another recently successful one. So how does that work for the folks that may not know? Sure. It, it actually started in 1996. It was the, uh, the brainchild of Paulette Sweeney Goodwin, who was the uh, first person to hold my position uh, as public relations manager. Uh, of course, that involves a lot of fundraising as well. But uh, over 14 campaigns, um, the public has helped purchase 17,751 new books. And the value of those books is it's just under uh, $400,000. So it's, it's big. Uh, and 
yes, we get some corporate donations and we get some, a little bit of municipal funding, just, you know, we, we do a, a grant application, but um, most of it, huge proportion of it comes from individuals uh, and small community organizations. So they get together and they're, they're just, they really support it. And I think it's because when you adopt a book, you can also be the first to borrow it. And of course you can adopt a book, you know, essentially you're buying the book, um, uh, but we call it an adoption. And, and people like that, they're, it's tangible. They can have that donation in the physical form in their hand and enjoy it. And they see it go on the shelf and they know that that's going to uh, be a gift to as many as 40 other people. You know, in that lifespan of that book because it's borrowed or, or more. Um, that's an average for all the books. But uh, so, yeah, it's a very successful campaign. Uh, you have other fundraisers at individual branches uh, as well. You've got one coming up, don't you? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, well, we have uh, to touch on that. Uh, we're really lucky to have two marvelous friends groups still going. Uh, one is at the uh, Lockport Library, so the Friends of the Lockport Library, and the Friends of the Shelburne Library, and they are huge supporters. The Lockport Friends will be holding their annual uh, plant and bake sale at the Lockport Library starting at 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow, I believe, so that'll be Saturday, May 13th, and the rain date is uh, May 20th. And the Shelburne Friends are going to be holding their annual yard sale at the Shelburne Library, and that's going to be Saturday, May 27th, starting at 9.30 and uh, with regard to the sh yard sale in Shelburne, people can contribute items to the fundraiser. They can bring them to the library during open hours uh, right up to uh, May 26th, so before 20 the 27th. And plants, books, and household items are welcome, but uh, clothing cannot be accepted. Uh, apologies. And I'm going to give you a tip for both of those important fundraisers. Get there early. I think... You know, when I look back at at, uh, at my childhood and what the library was for me when I was in school, I mean, certainly technology had not gotten to the point where you were dealing with the Internet. I won't say how old I am, but it, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, you know, we, we saw the library as a bit of a social hub. Is it still that way with, you know, different groups of age groups? I, I think so. Um, I don't have the privilege of being out in all the branches. Um, I, you know, I'm usually stashed back in the background in headquarters. <laughs> but uh, from what I see and know and talking to clerks, uh, there is certainly a, a social aspect that's still an important part of the library. It, it's sort of just kicking back into gear post-pandemic. Uh, um, but whether it's a, a playgroup for preschoolers you know, that's an important social moment, not just for the preschoolers, but for the parents who are bringing the kids there. Um, you do have uh, um, school-age kids, usually, I guess, um, junior high, maybe some high school as well, who meet up at the library. Some come to study. Um, some come just to they even play a little chess. Um, but there is certainly that element. Uh, we'd like to make it more so, of course. But uh, it still exists, Quinn. <laughs> That's good. That's good to hear. I, you know, I think that, you know, getting the kids away from their devices, there's a bonus in that no matter what happens. Well, the flip side of that, of course, is every library has free Wi-Fi access. So <laughs> they, they're probably quite happy to come here with their devices and make use of that as well. <laughs> there's something to be said for holding a book in your hand. Uh, I personally thoroughly enjoy reading a newspaper. Now, I work in the digital world. That's my day job. To spend, you know, eight, ten hours a day doing my day job online, online, online. I get, I get news online. I'm reading tips, stories, everything online. To be able to come away from that and just sit down and read a book in my hand or a newspaper in my hand, for me, is very relaxing and, and very uh, calming. But, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of newspapers go the way to the dodo, um, you know, are we, are we going to come to that when it comes to books? I mean, certainly a lot of books are still being printed. That's still a thing, quote unquote, but, um, you know, ebooks seems to have gained a, a bit of traction in popularity. Personally, I'm not a fan, but other people are. 
Yeah, I think it depends on who you are. And I don't think uh, as human beings we're ever going to get rid of books. I mean, look at the, uh, the record album. I mean, everybody thought those yes. were done. You know, you had CDs, etc., and then you went to streaming and digital music. But uh, you know, people like to put the record on the record player and spin enjoy it. My so vinyl. you Absolutely. know, um, I think yeah, the same can be said f for books and newspapers and magazines. Um, there's just, as you say, something about holding that book and being able to pick it up, put it down, flip that page. There's even a smell to a book that you don't get with your digital reader. Now, of course, if you're going on holiday and you're a big reader, it's a lot easier to put in an e-reader with 12 books on it than it is to carry 12 books in your suitcase. But so, you know, there's pros and cons to all of that. So I, I don't think uh, the physical book uh, will go the way of the dodo, but uh, I'm also not uh, necessary um, Nostradamus or a visionary, so <laughs> I, I can't say how that might work. We're not gonna we're not gonna hold it to you. We're not gonna come back <laughs> 20 years later and say, Ah, I gotcha. Um, one of the things that you know uh, people look towards when it comes to the library now more than ever is, is some of the programming that you have, uh, whether it's uh, learn how to safely surf the web or something along that. And so let's stick with, you know, the technology theme. Um, is there an opportunity for people in the community at large to share their skills? Do you actively have a volunteer base when it comes to putting on programming like that? Uh, certainly there, there is some of that and, and something we work really hard on and, and we're trying to uh, improve upon as well because I think there's all kinds of opportunities as partnerships. So uh, there's, you know, as you said, there's many great organizations and government services out there and they need a, a way to inform the public of their services and, and help people. So because we have 10 branches in Digby, Shelburne and Yarmouth that provide, you know, really good venues really for any of any of these programs through the partnerships so um so if you look at some of them we've got uh, our digital uh, trainer and mobile hotspot units they're both funded uh through at ns which is a great partner and they're also funding our, our three summer student positions so that's a, that's an example of a partnership and the positions summer positions are in digby shelburne and yarmouth and of course details about the job and how to apply are on our website under work at the library at westerncounties.ca. So all you students out there, there's an opportunity. Uh, recently, the library, through its partnership, has offered free programs such as income tax help for uh, persons with low income, fall prevention information, tax benefits and scam awareness programs, and story and playtime programs for preschoolers. So we work with Parents Place locally on that. Um, from May 23rd to June 16th, this is an interesting one, um, Lacey from Nova Scotia Health, she's going to be holding sessions at our libraries to help people learn how to connect with a doctor online for a consultation, diagnosis, treatment plan, online doctor's notes, and more virtual care. So those, um, as you say, it's, it's very important that we connect with uh, the local expertise or, or and in some cases, you know, there's the, the usual, uh, if you call it usual, uh, opportunities with authors or, or travelers or people with uh, certain um, specialties who can uh, do talks. Like, for example, in Yarmouth, in the fall and in the spring, we have our midweek breaks, which happen on Wednesdays at noon, from noon to one. So we have all kinds of uh, different topics and different presenters during those sessions. Good old-fashioned lunch and learn. <laughs> That's a phrase that maybe the three of us understand and nobody else. But I know that the uh, uh, issue of uh, accessibility has always been a priority for the Western Counties Regional Library. So how have you folks made it easier for, you know, people with mobility issues and, and other disabilities and impairments to, to be able to use the library in, in comfort? This, is, this has become uh, very, very important and uh, almost pretty much number one on the list of priorities now for, uh, for the library is accessibility. Uh, certainly, uh, the provincial government is pushing that as well. So um, 
we're working, uh, we haven't got there yet, but to make all of our services and buildings more accessible um, through training and access to new technology, helping people with a variety of disabilities, uh, such as, say, uh, print, and some of the services and items the library offers for people with print disabilities include uh, large print books, audio books, and e-books, portable daisy talking book players, a free access to a Center for Equitable Library Access, which is we call CELA, C-E-L-A, because acronyms, you know, people are generally lazy. That's right. And it's a lot easier <laughs> to say. And a National Network for Equitable Library Service, which is NELS. Um, we have borrow by mail and staff assisted selection, of course, videos and DVDs with descriptive text and captioned videos and DVDs. And uh, we also have, as of now, all 10 branches have accessible computer workstations. So they have nice big 27 inch full HD monitors, uh, large print keyboard, and specialized uh, trackball mouse. And of course, staff are always available to help people find books or audiobooks and this can be a one-time service or can be ongoing uh, for people who prefer to have staff supply them with favorite authors and titles uh, in their preferred format um, so when i say format of course i mean large print book or could even if we're working through an organization like seal or uh, you could get into uh, downloadable and electronic books and uh, People in this, who it might know, but DAISY MP3 and e-text formats, describe video, and Braille. So to people with, again, print disabilities. And people can sign up to download books to their own devices or computers or have items delivered directly to their home or library. And, of course, that's a free service. Um, some of the other services we offer outside of boring books, movies, music, and newspapers uh, include, uh, we're going to touch on this, but mobile hotspots. So um, talk about accessibility. Uh, obviously, the Internet is not accessible to everyone. So um, again, this is a project funded through ADNS, but um, we have 10, and they're very popular, so there's holds on them, but uh, <laughs> new mobile hot uh, Wi-Fi hotspots units, and that, uh, they allow people to have free access to the Internet. Um, they can be borrowed through our online catalog. Uh, you do need to have a device to connect to the hotspot, so a computer, a tablet, phone, or a smart TV. Um, and it goes through a, a, a Bell Canada server. Um, but uh, yeah, you just borrow it, uh, and make sure it's charged up, and away you go. So that's a, an important service. Uh, we have autism toolkits. So these kits offer sets of tools for individuals and families living with autism. And there's three sets of toolkits, bags available for borrowing, and they include fidget, sensory, and visual. Uh, and then we all need a little activity, right? Uh, so I think you're going to like this one, Gary, because it includes a rubber chicken. So, uh, well, <laughs> like the sound of that yeah. already. Everybody <laughs> needs a rubber chicken. That's right. Um, anyway, the BeFit kits include a wide range of activities for the whole family. So, they include a guidebook and they offer uh, game and play suggestions. You can throw a rubber chicken, catch a cloud, toss a flying disc, or play crazy ball. And uh, we also have radon detectors. So radon is believed to be responsible for killing more than 3,200 Canadians each year. And the library has 12 detectors to borrow for six weeks at a time. And that is a longer boring period because you need a certain length of time to do a proper test. And new is uh, energy meters. So these meters, of course, plug into a wall, and then you plug in an appliance into the meter, and it'll let you know whether, know whether or not it's an energy hog or it's a beautifully efficient machine. And uh, you can quickly determine whether or not it's time to throw out that old coffee maker uh, and buy an, an energy efficient one or, or keep it because it works just fine. I bought one of those, and, and it was fantastic because I you know, went from – place to place throughout the house trying to figure out, all right, you know, my electric bill's gone up and I'm trying to figure out why. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because it, it, people, they want longevity out of some of their appliances like a washer or, or, or a fridge or, or whichever, but yet don't realize at some point it it's working really, really hard to keep up. Now you may think, oh, well, it still freezes or it's still cold. True, but if it's working double time in order to do that, 
you've got a problem and you may not realize you got a problem until it like totally craps out. But in the meantime, your electric bill is just like way up. Yeah. The savings you could have by buying an energy efficient one. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, the savings alone from your old unit pays for the new unit. Uh, if you think of it that way. Yeah. 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 Uh, what I found out in the end is that it wasn't any of that. It was other stuff. Oh, you uh, left the door open all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an older house. So, uh, you know, insulation in the attic and the walls, mm. those sorts of things were contributing negatively to my power bill. Sure. Yeah. Oh, well, there's so many um, programs available now and, and some good um, financial incentives for people to, uh, you know, contact the right organization to do an audit of your home and now, you mentioned uh, assistance with taxes, and I know we're, we're past the quote-unquote tax deadline, but even, you know, if, if you need help catching up, you know, maybe somebody hasn't filed for a couple of years for whatever reason, there's still ongoing assistance, isn't there? Um, no, actually, we, uh, again, this is a partnership. So um, Canada Revenue Agency has uh, these volunteers in place, who uh, we connect through them, and they come into the branches and provide the service. So once the tax season is done, uh, they're, they're in specific dates in the branches. Okay. Um, and only, uh, so far, we only have them in our Digby, uh, Shelburne, and Yarmouth branches during tax season. Um, so, yeah, no, unfortunately, we don't have the, the staff uh, and the expertise to be able to do that year-round. You know, over the last few years, libraries, schools uh, have either been asked to or have made a decision on their own to ban certain books and certain publications. You know, is this something that the Western Counties Regional Library has ever faced? Um, ever faced? I, I don't have uh, knowledge of that. I'm sure that every once in a while somebody might send our, the executive director a a note, but uh, I, I'm not aware of any uh, hard and fast fights in this area over over a book being on the shelf. Um, the library has a board of directors, um, as most public organizations do, very dedicated group of, of individuals. And uh, just wondering, uh, you know, what their roles and responsibilities are as far as uh, the uh, Western Counties Regional Library is concerned? Uh, well, um, I guess their, their roles and responsibilities vary, but the board itself is, is, uh, has great representation. Um, so we have 11 municipal units within the tri-counties, and each municipal unit um, has... Uh, somebody represent them on the board. So um, we also have uh, a couple of provincial representatives. So you see those uh, come up in for advertising. So you can you know apply to be um, a provincial representative on the library board or another organization. So we, we have that representation. We also have some of the local groups that have um, important input. Like uh, Yarmouth Public Library has a representative, uh, the Admiral Digby Museum, uh, Shelburne Building Association, Shelburne Library Building Association. So there's, you know, it, it's a well-rounded representation. And, uh, yeah, they play uh, a valuable role, obviously. They're the, uh, they're the top um, they're the top executive, if you will. They, they guide our executive director and, uh, you know, they approve policy changes, that sort of thing, and uh, they may be, um, so it's important that uh, the library board members and the library itself and its staff are on the same page and working together to, to make libraries just that much better. What about volunteers, Ian? Um, does the library, can the library use volunteers? Yes, uh, we can use volunteers, but it, it's, it's an interesting um, uh, we have to take a, an interesting approach because we are a unionized envir uh, environment. So we, you can't have a volunteer who could potentially, you know, do, uh, do the regular work in that sense. But we do have um, 
we have to vet volunteers, as does any organization. Um, obviously, there's you know the checks that have to be done, but there are times. You know, we certainly we have a, a super volunteer in Yarmouth called his name is Mark Pittman. He's been with us forever, and he's not only is he a he does helps do our recycling uh, once a week. He comes in and collects everything, and but he is uh, a wealth of knowledge about books and movies. <laughs> if you ever have a moment to chat with him, he he could give you some sage advice on what to read next. <laughs> but so yeah, we do have a place for volunteers in s certain specialized areas. Um, it's not something we have a lot of. But then we have times where we can use one-off volunteers. So for say a fundraising event, um, I'm I'm looking at uh, early stages of, of planning a new fundraiser for this fall, which would be a uh, a walk. Uh, it's called, you know, the, this is nothing official, but it's called Legging It for Literacy, and you can dress up as your favorite literary character, and so I'll be looking for some volunteers to help with that, for example. And if somebody's interested in reaching out and learning more, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, they can do it in, uh, they can contact their local branch if that's easier for them, but they can also email me uh, and public relations at westerncounties.ca if you've got your pens and pencils or a great memory. <laughs> but it's all there at westerncounties.ca too. If you, you search through, you, you'll find an email address. And if you send it to the email address, hopefully somebody will guide it to the right person. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have it like an online newsletter, notifications of upcoming events, that kind of stuff? Oh yes, yeah. Our, our, if you, uh, I, I recommend that people go to westerncounties.ca and explore. We have a, an events section and an events calendar. We have um, how to support your library. So there's different areas where you can, you know, make a donation and and help out. Um, there's all kinds of information on the board on. Um, our management staff, there's uh, meeting minutes, there's newsletters, there's annual reports, there's all of that information is, is there on the website. I must say, as a user of the website, it's incredible. It's amazing. Oh, I'm glad to hear that because yeah. it's new relatively. You yeah. brought it online just over a year ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and you're right. Anything you can think of, it's, it's there. It's very accessible, very easy to use. Ian, uh, thanks very much. It's been great to see you again, and uh, boy, the information uh, that you gave us is just incredible. It certainly, as I said earlier, is not the library of, of your father or your grandfather. Uh, it's an amazing place. It's a, a vital hub of the community, and uh, we appreciate you chatting with us. Oh, it's been my pleasure, and thank you very much for thinking of the library, and it's fantastic to see both of you. I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this has been Outside My Window. <laughs>